You know, Alexa touched on something that's very interesting there around sort of what you're facing right now and your expectations and trying to manage that with your experience you're currently going through. So let's jump straight into the word, and then we'll talk a bit more afterwards. All right, so we're going to read from the gospel according to John. It's from verse 11, sorry, chapter 11, from verse 32, all the way to the end of 44. And it says, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. If the Bible you have is yours, highlight or underline, then Jesus wept. And then verse 36 says, the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave of a stone rolled across his entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you, you would see God's glory if you believe. Again, underline, if you believe. In verse 41, so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Also underline that in your Bible. And verse 44 says, and the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Finally, unwrap, underline that, unwrap him and let him go. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, very thankful for this opportunity to bring a word to your people today, to my siblings. I ask that you encourage them, Holy Spirit, filter the word so they understand how it applies in their daily lives and they can be encouraged as they go home. In Jesus' name. Right, there's a couple of things I want to share with you from the scripture today because here we see with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus a difference between their expectations and their experience, the reality they had and what they were hoping to get out of a visit from Jesus. And maybe you have something similar. It could be the same pair of pajamas that you get on Christmas, don't quite match up with what you thought you were going to get. It could be an exam result, or it could be more serious, going to a GP for a routine check and getting something that you weren't expecting. You know, for me, my strongest experience of this was my final year of university. After Christmas break, parents dropped me back at uni, it was in Canterbury down the road, and there was the usual Third year, go and get a degree, do what you came to do. We'll see you on Easter Sunday. All right, and that was the plan. A few days later, my mum calls me and she says, listen, your dad's not well, he's been rushed to hospital. Can you get your connect group to pray along with you and see what we can do, get the church to pray along? So I called my, my cell group, that's what connects were called back then, and it was, hey guys, listen, here's what's happening, let's pray along, get the church praying, and so we did. It was our faith practice. A few days on from that, mum says, um, can you pause your uni work? Come to Darren Valley Hospital. Because the doctors are saying things that don't sound good to hear. They're asking the families to gather. And so I jump on the National Express. And I remember on that coach journey, I'm reading my Bible and I'm praying and I'm searching through scripture. And I'm like, Lord, please, this is our expectation that he gets well. Just do your will as long as your will is what I want. Just get it done. <laughs> you know. And so for us... I arrived in that particular um, intensive care unit bay, and I remember the doctor pulling us aside into the waiting room, and he says to us, listen, we've done everything we medically can do. We reckon we've got two, three hours or thereabouts, and you know, we'll see how things, how things pan out. And sort of, I guess, very faithfully, I said to him, thank you very much for professional opinion. You know, this is where Jesus steps in. You know, and, um, and it's funny because if we think in the first half of the scripture, and I encourage you to read it in John chapter 11, right, you have the same kind of feeling. Mary and Martha, they know their brother's unwell. We don't know what kind of illness he had, but they can sense within that, whether he's limp or he's in and out of consciousness, it's not going to be good. So they're like, let's send word to Jesus. He's in the region. Let's even get him down here as soon as he can. And like, Jesus, can you order donkey exec on Uber or get a chariot and please get here ASAP, right? Lazarus is not looking good. And so... I can imagine what they're feeling. And they're like, in the morning they wake up, they look out to the horizon, is that Jesus? No, no, you know, is that a postman? 
Every time the door knocks, you know, they run to the door, and you have that sort of weird mix of expectation of, is it Jesus? You open the door, and you're like, ah, oh, okay. The neighbor's bringing a care package. Thank you, but you're not really who we're expecting. But Jesus does something very interesting. He chooses to wait. Where he was, was a couple of days' journey, and he chooses to delay intentionally. And you have to wonder, by the time he shows up, and where we're reading from, this is mixed of disappointment, right? It's like, Jesus, if only you had been here, this wouldn't happen. And the crowd, the people say so. They're like, hey, listen, he healed the sick. I mean, it's not too much trouble to show up to a dying man's bed and heal him, right? And so you might be thinking to yourself, based on where you currently are right now and what you're experiencing, whether it's in your finances, in your health, you know, in your marriage, you know, your children, maybe what you're currently experiencing right now and what your expectations are when you set out on the journey aren't matching up and there's a disconnect there. You know, I want to tell you from the very, very first point is Jesus understands. The most important thing that I picked out in the scripture was from verse 35. If one of your goals for this year is to rack up memory verses, then this is a free gift for me to you. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. It says, then Jesus wept. But you have to wonder, because he knew Lazarus was dead. He knew Lazarus was going to die. He told his disciples, Lazarus is asleep. And they were like, oh, we're going to wake him up. He was like, no, no, he's dead. Right? You know, he was very clear about it. He knew what he was doing. So why would Jesus cry? Why would he come there and look at everyone else weeping? And he wasn't like he was wailing like they were. He was, you know, it literally in the Greek says he shed tears. Why would he cry? Because fundamentally, what this tells us is that Jesus cares. He's not a bystander. He's not passive in a situation. He's not looking at you and thinking, oh, you know what, that's a shame. I'll get to that when I can. Jesus is vested in your situation. He cares very much about what you're going to. You know, in Psalm 34 and verse 18, it reminds us, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. So I don't know what's breaking your heart right now and what, what you're facing in the moment, but I want to remind you that Jesus cares. He's very, he's very much close to you. In your moments of weakness, in your moments of challenge, in your moments of pain, of suffering, Jesus is very close to you. If you're feeling crushed and pressed on all sides, I want to tell you that God is there. Rescue is at hand. It is coming. Hold on. Wait for it. The Lord does not do things in the same time frame that we do, but he very much wants to help you. And so we come to a place where we see Jesus crying, and he's crying with Martha, and he's crying with Mary, and he's crying with everyone else, even though he knows what he's going to do next. And so for me, as I, after those words of the doctor, as I sort of stood there in, in the, um, at the bedside of, the, of my dad, as the doctor said, you know, a couple of hours later, right, and that Friday afternoon, all the alarms in the machine start blaring off in a way in which signals the worst things have happened, right, and I'm lying there on the floor, and I'm in tears, my entire world shattered, and I'm thinking, but Jesus, I, I believed, right, you know, um, I have faith, I'm there, what's going on, and the only thing that can come to me in between those gasps of breath is a, is a very strange hymn, it's, for those who know it, it's, um, it is well with my soul, Right? And in the days and weeks afterwards, as you do, if you've gone through a grief cycle, you start analyzing all the things you could have done differently and how things could have played out. I decided to search and work out what the background of this song was. Where did it come from? Why was I being comforted by this thing? Why did the Holy Spirit drop it in my, you know, in my soul? And I want to tell the story of the author of, the, of that hymn, a man called Horatio Spafford. So Horatio was a father, husband. He was a successful lawyer in Chicago. He lived in the 1800s. Um, he was also a devout Christian. So he lost his only son in 1870, as well as all of his business assets in, a great, in the Great Chicago Fire. And after a string of very bad results, he just said to his family, you know what, let's take a break. We're going to go to England on holiday, all right? And we'll hopefully just reset, come back, and sort everything else out. So in November 1873, his wife, himself, he had four other daughters, we're ready to set sail. And then some more business happening started going on. So he was like, guys, let me not ruin everyone's trip. You guys go on ahead, right, and I'll join you. 12 days in, Horatio gets a, um, a note, a telegram, as it was back then, that the ship in which his family's on sank, claiming the lives of 226 people, including his four daughters. So now Horatio has now lost five children, and gets a telegram from his wife when she gets to Cardiff with six simple words, saved alone, what shall I do? 
And so the story goes that as he was voyaging to meet his grieving wife, Anna, from the daughter they had after this um, incident, that when he got to the spot where the ship had sank, carrying his daughters, this is where the Holy Spirit gave him this song that has endured for 150 years plus. And so I know that it is very challenging when the midst of experience you're in right now to see how it can benefit you, let alone others. But I promise that God is working his way through it. He has promised and given to us as a word that all things work together for our good who are called according to his purpose. So I want to encourage you that as long as you stay in his purpose, God will work it out. And as we sing, if it's not, if it's not good, it's not finished. So trust the Lord and hold fast and be strong in his word. So if you're wondering and you're thinking to yourself, Jesus, if you were there, if you had done this, if you had averted this, I want to speak the word of the Lord to you today. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Because what Jesus challenged his disciples and challenged Mary and Martha in the situation was, you are used to seeing the usual. You've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me heal, feed thousands. I want to show you something unusual. For us, we read and we understand the Bible and we see within that that Jesus had raised people from the dead. This was the first time he was doing Lazarus. They had never seen anything like this before. So instead of you expecting the usual, I want to challenge you, expect the unusual from God because you want to take it from a, from a usual miracle to an unusual miracle, from a usual breakthrough to an unusual breakthrough. He wants to take you to an unusual and deeper place with the Father. He wants to take you much closer into a close relationship so you can walk much more faithfully. And so we come to the second point I'll share with you today, which is as we go on, we see that Jesus called to Lazarus and he's called him to come out of the tomb. And Lazarus comes out and he's bandaged up. And he says to the people gathered there, unwrap him and let him go. And that truth is this. You cannot have liberty unless you have life. You can't be free unless you have faith. I don't know what's holding you bound. I don't know what's keeping you in a grave. I don't know what's keeping you in a tomb. But I do know this. If you have faith, freedom is not far behind. And you need to understand that Jesus is coming for you. And he's going to use the people around you to help you with that. Jesus could have unwrapped Lazarus himself, but he chose not to. He asked the people around, help him. So rely on your church people. Rely on your connect group. Rely on your, your friends in faith. Because as long as there's faith, freedom is coming shortly afterwards. And so I want to ask you, as we round up here, to remember that there is one voice and one voice alone. Right, that responds, the grave responds to. And that's the voice of Jesus. No matter what you're, look, you're, what you're looking at right now, no matter what looks dead or dying, whether it's in your body, in your mind, whether it's your relationships, whether it's your schoolwork, I know that Jesus can turn it around. I know that although it seems, as Alexa said, naturally impossible, with God truly all things are possible. He can turn things around in a way you can never imagine. And so I'd like us to rise to our feet, please. And there's a band come up. The truth is that God doesn't answer prayers in the way which we think he does. Not all the time. And you've had an opportunity with Alexa to encounter Jesus and talk through and, and, and make a proclamation of faith. At this point in time, what I want to do is give you an opportunity to respond because there's three types of people that show up in this story. There's Jesus as the initiator of the miracle, his responsibility is to, in effect, bring Lazarus back from the dead. Only he can do that. If you have faith, he can do that for you right now. He's doing that for you right now. Then there is Lazarus as the recipient of that. And your situation can be turned around very easily. And then there's the people. So if the connect leaders can come to the front, please, and help me out with this, I'd be very much appreciated. Because the unwrapping the letting go, the freedom was in the hands of the people. And so wherever you are in the auditorium, in the lobby, downstairs, search within your heart. Whatever it is that you need to be freed from, whatever it is that needs Christ to step into, whatever seems dead, don't be shy. Come to the front right now. Let them pray with you. You haven't got to tell them what it is. God knows what it is. You come to the front and let them unwrap it for you. We'll wait for you in the lobby. Just come downstairs. 
you have any kind of challenges at all, whatever needs God's breakthrough, God's healing touch, God's unusual breakthrough, let him pray with you. Because he's not asking you for more money. He's not asking you for more time. He's not asking to pray more. He said simply, if you believe, that's all it takes and that's what it requires.